Hello and welcome to Hymns for Worship and Inspiration. I'm Ralph Cullen. Today I want to look at a very special hymn from the late 19th century. But as Easter approaches, I just want to reflect a little bit first on a personal note of why I have such a passion for the use of the organ in leading worship. Some of you watching this are probably well-trained organists and possibly observe what I do with a little bit of amusement or even as I've had some respond on my YouTube channel with a bit of disdain. And that's okay, but I want to share my story. My dear mother signed me up for piano lessons when I was about nine years old. And uh, oh, what a strain that turned out to be. Uh, Practising the piano for even half an hour uh, drove me mad and I'm sure everybody else in the house to the extent that after 18 months I just said I couldn't cope and my dear mother relented and let me take a break. And I look back now with a certain regret because I kind of think that if I had been more disciplined or practiced better I probably would have been quite good. But as it stands that was not to be. It's interesting the way our lives go. But then everything changed for me. In my mid-teens, I went to an Easter convention uh, that used to be run in uh, not far from Auckland. Uh, this was uh, set up by the Bible College, what was the Bible Training Institute in those days. And probably there are about 2,000 people and, uh, and accompanied by one lone piano the singing blew me away. I came home from there with a desire that has never left me to simply be somebody who could lead a congregation in worship. I had no interest in anything but exploring the hymn book and, uh, and the hymn I chose to start was the one that I want to talk about today. A hymn by Philip Bliss, Man of Sorrows, What a Name, Hallelujah, What a Saviour. And there was two reasons for that. The first was that this was the theme of that Easter convention and it was sung several times over that weekend and frankly couldn't get the tune or the song out of my head when I went home. But secondly, I saw that the harmony was simple and perhaps it was something that I could play. It was written in C major and I could pick my way through it little by little uh, with my limited piano training as a nine-year-old, uh, I could find my way around that hymn tune. And I played it and played it and played it until I had it off by heart. The simple structure of uh, major, relative, minor, minor uh, major, third, subdominant, back to the tonic formed the basis of many songs, which I'll talk about in a moment. And then I found, after I'd mastered that one, I found a hymn in F major and worked on that. And then a B flat and I worked my way around the different uh, keys until one day I found myself in a church meeting and no music before me and I was expected to play and lead a congregation. Well, miracle of miracles, I found that the chord structures that I had by playing those hymns the chord structures that had been put into my fingers came to the party and having the feel of those relative uh, relationship between those chords, I found I could play without any music. Now, handling this, but not losing the far more difficult task of following classical tunes such as written by George Handel and, and J.S. Bach and uh, or even the most excellent work of 19th century writers such as J.B. Dykes and Arthur Sullivan's is a trick I'm st still working on. But that's enough of me. 
I'd like to talk about this hymn because it's very, very special. And first about the writer, Philip Bliss, uh, was born in Clearfield County, Pennsylvania, 1838. And sadly, he didn't live a long time. In fact, the tragedy happened in uh, 1876, which made him 38 years old. He was involved in a train wreck in Ohio. And although he survived the initial crash, he ran back into the train to save his wife, Lucy, and they both lost their lives. It was caused by a bridge collapse. But he was a hymn writer who typified that period of history. And there were two things that were happening. This was the tail end of the Second Great Awakening in the Americas. And we see a shift in the emphasis on many hymns away from the more objective theology of the classical and Baroque periods and more of a reflection of what was going on in the Second Great Awakening so that many hymns started to reflect and express a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so Bliss was a great hymn writer. He is famous for uh, many of these, what I guess we could loosely call gospel songs, Almost Persuaded, Dare to Be a Daniel, Jesus Loves Even Me, Let the Lower Lights Be Burning, I Will Sing of My Redeemer, and Sing Them Over Again to Me, Wonderful Words of Life. And the one I want to present today, Man of Sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came. Uh, Bliss worked with Ira D. Sankey and with Dwight Moody, and he lot of, uh, wrote a lot of music and some for the hymns of Fanny Crosby, who perhaps was the most prolific hymn writer of the late 19th century in the United States. He also wrote the music to Stafford's now famous him, it is well with my soul. Some say that if he had lived as long as Wesley or even Crosby, he would have become the greatest hymn writer in history. Very hard to say. But before I talk about the hymn, I just want to talk a little bit more about musically. There's a shift away from the classical and earlier Baroque style of writing in which um, we find typical of the 18th and early 19th century in which harmony is much more clearly balanced between four parts in the hymn tune. But what we begin to see is a more chordal structure that lends itself to playing these hymns even on instruments that don't clearly define a tune, such as a guitar. In many ways, this is a part of the decline of Western music. But on the positive side, the singing of these great hymns or uh, is made very easy to the extent that such a tune is hard to get out of one's head once it's entered there, and that's what happened to me. Man of Sorrows is a simple hymn, and, it, and very much an Easter to hymn in which we can reflect upon the cross. And taken, of course, from the scripture in Isaiah 53, he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquity. He, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. 
So in five simple verses, Bliss gives us these thoughts. What a name. And in each verse, there's a contrast. So first of all, he begins, what a name. A man of sorrows. But then the little chorus, hallelujah. What a saviour. Second verse, he bore shame and scoffing. And he condemned, was condemned in my place. But then he sealed my pardon with his blood. That's our saviour. Third verse, guilty, vile, and helpless, that's us, we. But contrast, spotless Lamb of God was he. And the conclusion, full atonement, question mark, can it be? Is this that good? Yes, it is. What a saviour. And now another contrast, lifted up, was he to die? It is finished, was his cry. But now, in heaven, exalted high. Hallelujah. What a saviour. And then the final verse. The ransomed, redeemed, will one day stand before him and sing anew this song. I heard a preacher once say, you know, we can have all the questions in the world about theology, about church governance. We can argue over the second coming of Christ. We can bicker over this, and we can bicker over that. But when we stand before him, all of that will be forgotten. And all will be forgotten except one thing the Lamb of God that was slain for us. Hallelujah. What a Saviour.